Hello world, Noah here. Earlier this week at the WWDC 2020 keynote, Apple announced that Macs are officially moving to Apple's custom silicon. Apple did a pretty good job of explaining this, but given the general audience and fast pace of the event, they didn't go into too much detail. Today, we're going to take a look under the hood and see what exactly this change means for developers. We'll discuss the move to ARM, compatibility technologies Rosetta 2 and Universal 2, and what developers will have to do to update their apps. Without further ado, let's get started. Apple Silicon is based on the ARM architecture, which marks a shift from Intel's x86 architecture. In order to understand the difference, we'll have to look at the most fundamental levels of computer programming. This will get a little bit technical, but I promise if you stick with me, everything will make sense. As you probably know, computers work in binary. A bit, or binary digit, can take on the values of 0 or 1. Now let's build up a level. How can we represent numbers? Our everyday numbers are decimal or base 10 numbers, which means that we have 10 digits, 0 through 9, and each place value is a power of 10. For example, the number 1, 2, 3 is actually 123, or 1 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 to the first plus 3 times 10 to the 0. We can do something similar with binary. Since binary is base 2, there are two possible values, 0 and 1, and each place value is a power of 2. So for example, the binary number 101 has a value of 1 times 2 squared plus 0 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the 0, which is 5 in decimal. If we have enough bits, we can represent arbitrarily large numbers, and we can use a trick to also represent negative numbers. Now that we can represent numbers in binary, let's try and design a simple computer. Our computer will be able to do four tasks, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Additionally, we'll give it three memory slots that we can read and modify. You can think of variables from computer science. Now, how exactly do we tell the computer what we want it to do? Well, we communicate with computers using binary, and we know how to represent numbers in binary. So we can assign a number to each of our commands and memory slots. So let's say that I put the value 4 into memory slot 0 and 6 into memory slot 1, and I want to write a program that adds the contents of memory slots 0 and 1 and stores the result into memory slot 2. Well, let's first write this in English. We can write add 0, 1, 2, which means precisely what we just said. Add the contents of memory banks 0 and 1 and store the result to memory slot 2. So we know that add has id 0, so we'll translate it into binary as 0, 0. I'm using two zeros here because there are four possible operations, which means that we need two bits to represent those four possible operations. Next, we'll translate 0 to 0, 0, 1 to 0, 1, and 2 to 1, 0. And thus, our command is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, which we can write in this more compact form without any spaces. Assuming we've designed our CPU to handle commands in this way, we could feed this command into our CPU, and it will do the operation that we expect. What I've just described here isn't an abstract thought experiment. This is exactly how computers work. The add operation is an assembly instruction, and the process of converting human-readable code into binary is called compilation. Our choice of operators, or instructions, and memory slots, which are actually called registers, is completely arbitrary. And that's exactly what ARM and x86 are. They're ISAs, or instruction set architectures. An ISA is a definition of instructions and registers that a processor can implement. If two processors implement the same ISA, then they can run the same programs. The primary difference between ARM and x86 is that ARM is a RISC architecture, or reduced instruction set computing architecture, whereas x86 is a CISC architecture, or a complex instruction set computing architecture. Basically, CISC architectures have many more instructions than RISC architectures, which makes them both more efficient in some cases, but also more complex. For example, a CISC architecture might include a single instruction to add three registers, whereas a RISC architecture would just tell you to do two separate add instructions. But here's the thing. Unless you're writing assembly code, which you most likely aren't, the underlying architecture doesn't really matter to you. Let's say you're writing some code in C, 
When you want to run the code, you have to put it through a compiler, which will translate the human-readable code into binary instructions. But which binary instructions? Well, if you put the code through an ARM compiler, you'll get ARM instructions. And if you put the code through an x86 compiler, you'll get x86 instructions. So if you're using C, or any language above assembly, the underlying architecture doesn't matter to you. There is one exception, though. When you build an app or game or website, you don't start from scratch. You build on top of a framework that someone else provides for you. In the case of native macOS apps, two such frameworks are AppKit and SwiftUI. Now, if AppKit and SwiftUI are only compiled for x86, you won't be able to use them on ARM. But if they're compiled for both platforms, you'll be able to use them on both platforms. Of course, since Apple makes AppKit and SwiftUI, this won't be a problem, but we'll get back to this later. In order to help make the transition as seamless as possible, Apple has reintroduced two compatibility technologies, Rosetta 2 and Universal 2. The original Rosetta and Universal were introduced at WWDC 2005, almost 15 years ago, when Steve Jobs announced the transition from PowerPC to Intel. Rosetta 2 translates Intel-based programs so that they can run on ARM. The translation isn't perfect, but it's definitely good enough to hold users over until developers update their apps. Rosetta 2 translation happens the first time an Intel-based app is launched, and the translated binary is then used for every subsequent launch. Rosetta 2 also supports just-in-time or JIT compilers, JIT compilers dynamically compile and execute code. For example, a browser can use a JIT compiler to compile and execute JavaScript code, which is usually faster than interpreting it. Unfortunately, Rosetta 2 doesn't support kernel extensions or virtual machine programs like VMware Fusion or Parallels Desktop. These programs would have to be rewritten to be ARM compatible, and it's not clear if they'd still be able to run Windows or other x86-based operating systems. Universal 2 is much more straightforward. Mac apps are basically glorified folders. If you right-click on a Mac app and choose Show Package Contents, you can see the contents of the app. If you then go to Contents and then Mac OS, you can see the actual executable that's run when you open the app. A Universal 2 app contains an ARM executable and an x86 executable, and Mac OS will run the correct executable depending on the device's processor architecture. So now that we understand what the switch to ARM really means, let's talk about what developers have to do to update their apps. Thanks to Rosetta 2, developers don't actually have to do anything to get their apps to run on an ARM processor. As long as the app uses relatively modern frameworks and it doesn't use any architecture-specific hacks like embedded assembly, it should work just fine. However, as Apple notes in their Rosetta document, Rosetta is not a substitute for creating a native version of your app. In fact, Rosetta support won't exist forever, probably only for a few years. Creating a native ARM version of your app should be as easy as compiling the app in Xcode 12. Xcode 12 will automatically build a Universal 2 app with both ARM and x86 binaries. There's a chance that some code won't be able to compile directly to ARM, but any necessary changes should be minimal, especially if your app is written in Swift and you're using a modern framework like SwiftUI. If you want to test this out today, you can download the Xcode 12 for macOS Universal Apps beta from the Apple Developer website. You won't be able to test your app on an ARM device unless you can get your hands on the Developer Transition Kit, but you can at least see if your code will compile. There's also a section of the Apple Developer documentation dedicated to Apple Silicon that goes in-depth about the changes you'll have to make to your app. The good news is that the changes are very few and pretty specific, so the switch should be seamless for most developers. Apple's switch to custom silicon and ARM is the beginning of a new era for the Mac, one where we can expect to see Macs that are more powerful and efficient than we could have ever imagined. As a consumer, I'm incredibly excited to see the new Macs that Apple puts out over the next few years, and as a developer, I'm incredibly excited to build cool apps for these new Macs. Now that you understand what exactly the switch means for developers, I hope you are too. Thanks for watching, and happy hacking.